before the next speaker. Um, we have some announcements. One is after the last talk, the bar will open. Okay? The bar. <laughs> A bunch of alcoholics up in the audience, huh? I don't like this more in beer. I need to say that publicly. I find it offensive to me and other black people. It's, yeah, just ban this shit. It's, this is an official complaint against the racist beer. Let's, let's ban that. Okay, anyway, so side note. So bar will open uh, after the talk, and then 45 minutes later, there will be a live band up here. Uh, for, for music and chill vibes, and that'll be for about 90 minutes, and then there's, there's a live DJ after that. So the after party is going to be lit, okay? Yeah, I feel a shit. Um, your applause woke me up. So um, let us, with that, introduce the next speaker. We just had Michael. Michael's sitting right there. This is Michael. I don't want to say number two, you know, because he's original Michael. This, this, this is Michael Arnaldi, okay? Um, Michael is, so I had the privilege of sitting next to Michael last night at dinner, and and the, the man's very smart. There's no, there's no question about it. Mathematics background, loves functional programming, can probably explain monads to you, but I won't ask. Um, and, and, you know, uh, is, is, is the author and maintainer of an amazing library that he's probably going to tell you about. So I will not spoil it. Everybody, give your warmest applause, Michael Arnaldi. Thank you very much. Does it work? One, two, three? Yeah, that's it. Thank you very much, Terios, for the for this for this weird introduction. And I have to say thank you for allowing me to be here to all of the organizers. This is a fantastic place and a fantastic conference that, that you have organized. So today my my talk is is it yeah, that works. My talk today is tackling the hardest problems in JavaScript. I Problem is, I'm not gonna mention the word functional programming or monads at all. Uh, <laughs> no, no, I'm not gonna do that again. But that's basically the, the short story of my life. I've been building JavaScript, and I would have to say TypeScript application for, for the good part of the last 10 years. I've been in industry since way before. And I have seen a number of patterns repeating and repeating all over again when, when we try to take our first version of, a, of, an, of an app that, that we all build in Rush, that we all build with, the, with wanting to deliver something beautiful, amazing, quickly. But then the reality hits once we get to bring that in production, like you have loading screens that never ends, you got to debug stuff. You have unpredictability going on. So that's what this talk is going to be about. First, I'm going to show what at least my version of, a, of an initial app code looked like before. And if I don't have effect, that's pretty much how I would write an app at the first, the first time. So I was thinking what, what, what could be a small enough example to fit the code of the slides. And I've taken over, uh, I've taken a look at the, at the JSON placeholder API and decided to make a small example of an application that aims to fetch a number of to-dos from the, from the JSON placeholder APIs, API and render it on screen. Uh, that's gonna be a backend application, so uh, we have three functions here. Function number one, simply gonna go get the data for a specific ID in the JSON placeholder API. Second, and you can see that we are using the classical async await, and we are first fetching, and then based on the result, we are awaiting the, the response, and we are expecting the response to be a JSON, and we are deserializing it. This function returns the promise of an unknown um, using TypeScript for the purpose of the examples because it's a little bit easier to show things. The second function is a, it's get to do's. And here is where things start to become more interesting. We want to fetch a list of to do's. And the first 
obvious implementation that we do is a sequential one, which it's not that efficient, but that kind of does the job in a, in a first version. And so we, we have basically still in the style of an async await, we have a for loop, and we ending up doing the, the await exactly within the, the for loop. So this is fully sequential. The third function is the main function that we're supposed to invoke as the entry point of our program, and that simply gives us back a list of to-dos and iterates over it, printing out the result. Great, that's a very small example of what, what an app can be. And as, as I said before, that's kind of the first version. Have you ever built something like that? Any of your code looks similar to what I've shown you? Yes, good. So, what's happening in the road to production, though? And to be clear, we can ship the app as it is. We are not forced to do anything more at first, but we are progressively going to realize problems one by one. One of the first problems that we might encounter is our app might be a little bit too slow. We've been doing everything in sequence. And you can imagine in my example, I'm fetching five to-dos. Let's, let's imagine fetching 500,000 to-dos. So we do want concurrency. How to achieve concurrency? Well, the first natural uh, implementation is basically this one, where instead of having an await inside here, uh, inside the, the, the push, we, we end up accumulating promises, accumulating an array of promises, and we return a wait of promise.all that's going to wait for all of the promises to be resolved and respond with an array of the result. In fact, if we see the code here, it's going to return a promise of an anchor. Oh, promise of an anchor. That's that's wrong. It should probably be Anknon array. But I guess Anknon, it's also an Anknon array. Never use Anknon, never use any, except in slide examples. But are we really OK with that? That's going to run everything in parallel. That's literally going to run 500,000 requests in parallel. Now, unless you have an extremely optimized API, you're going to crash the API. And all of your requests, 90 plus percent of requests, are going to fail for timeouts and anything else. So we kind of have to chunk it a little bit. We have to use some concurrency, but just enough for the application to be fast and not too much to crush the servers behind. That's one of the first solutions that I actually took from code from like five years ago. And that's roughly chunking up requests. So I'm having to resolve a list of IDs. I first chunk those, and I resolve each chunk. And in here, you see that the promise.all only applies to the, to the single chunk. Is that really OK? Do you notice anything weird with that type of function? Anybody knows what, what can go can, can happen? No? Errors and delays. That's nice. Delays, most, most likely. This is going to run five requests after five requests after five requests after five requests. If any of those five requests ends up being slow, that's going to slow down the next batch. What you would really want is to go at the limit. It's to say I want five concurrent requests running all the time up until you've starved the remaining. How does that look like? Well, things are getting slightly more complicated. You see, I already had to 
lower a little bit the font for the, for the code to fit in slides. And I can take you through what's, what's going on in the details. I have to mention, please, if you find any bugs in this code, shout out to me. Because the moment I wrote this code, the next day, checking again the slides, I found three bugs in it. Probably the, I wrote this code 100 times before. And if I just show you this piece of code, does any of you, is any of you able, without, without reading the signature, which might, might clarify a bit of things, but if I remove the signature at first eye, will you be able to tell me what, what this code is doing? I, I'm not. I've seen a lot of code. I've seen hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines of code. But taking through the details, what are we doing here? Well, seems like we're kind of building a state machine that keeps track of what's going on, progressively ends up while, when, something, when something is finished, it decides either it decreases the amount of pending requests and it pushes the result on the thing. We have a catch handler, so if, if something goes wrong, we probably blow up everything. And if we have nothing left, we resolve with the, with the results. That's still bearable. Not nice, but bearable. But then, is it really fine? Because looking at the code, you see that there's a single reject at the first, the first thing that goes wrong, I'm killing off all the process which is fine because I'm interested in having all good results. That's the behavior I want here. But when something goes wrong, I, one, don't want to continue requesting more things. Two, canceling whatever is still ongoing because there's no point letting resources out, go out. So in recent years, I have to say when when I was writing my first lines of JavaScript, none of that was, was possible, but now they've s the abort controller and abort signal have become standards, so there is a way you can do interruption. And yes, you have to do it pretty much inside the code. So this is becoming more complex and more complex and more complex, and the font is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. I hope the ones in the back can't read the code, so you're not gonna be scared by it. We are not close to what would be needed. As some of you said, there was two things going, well, problematic. Delays, timeouts, and, well, resilience because there are some errors in your app that are unpredictable. And on those errors, you should really fail. One of the, the best advices somebody can give in the context of cloud, for example, let it fail fast. As soon as something non-expected happens, let it fail fast. Another system can recover quickly. Don't keep it running. But there are some things that are predictable. Like we've heard from, from Johannes this morning, the, the local first design is all about not having to deal with the network, having programs that works without the network. Well, figure it out what, the network is unreliable. So it's nothing strange if an HTTP get post or whatever just doesn't come, just doesn't come back with a response or any other thing happens. Request gets dropped. What should you do? Should you fail the whole program because a network request was wrong? I don't think so, especially if it's a get request. So what we really want to do is we want to retry on those errors. We would like to retry only on those. It's not very productive to retry if something unexpected went out, as I said before. But it's hard. 
And to be honest, after a few attempts, I found absolutely no way of putting that in the slides. So I opted out for, well, not kind of retry, retrying on every error. And is it a normal retry? Is it fine to retry constantly? Well, not really. Uh, is it fine to retry every 10 milliseconds? Well, depends. The best practices uh, in, in, in the industry are to retry with some sort of exponential growth curve, such that you start retrying very fast at the beginning, and if you still see that your program doesn't work, that the requests keep failing, the worst thing you can do is keep retrying as fast as possible. Because if you have a, a service with degraded performance, you're gonna kill it. You're gonna bring it down. The best thing you should do is start to wait, start to retry fast, but slow down the retry as you go. But would you really want an unbounded time? Does it really make sense for our program to wait for 10 days? Maybe, maybe in some cases, yes, but probably most of what we build doesn't, doesn't have that type of, we should get back to the user a response. Fasting out 10 days, that's a little bit too much. So what's the, what's the deal? Gotta put some cap at the maximum and gonna put a limit of retries. And if you see, anything here gets inside the same option parameter, you could use multiple parameters, you could write this function in any style you want, but the point is all of that needs to be coupled. I have one policy which knows what my retry strategy. It's not specialized based on the error, and me wanting to organize code a little bit better, at least I extracted the retry logic out, but again, if I extract the logic out, I have no longer the ability of specializing what happens based on the error. Now, the slides are small. I, and I want at least the people in front of me to read the code. So I sort of stopped here and sort of listed some other things that you might, you might encounter. I wanna be clear about that. Not all of those things are strictly required. And not all of those things you will know at the first day. Your program has to evolve over time, especially if it works, especially if it touches production, and especially if it grows. So what's, what's left? Well, logging, gotta, gotta log. Gonna make some, some distinguishment between logging an error, logging, and information logging a debug message, namely the logging should be multi-level. And also you've got cases where you have an app that fails and no logs are shown at all. That, that may be because the problem happened in a, in a portion of the program where you need to escalate the log level locally to say, okay, on this section of the program, I actually wanna turn now, turn, turn that, uh, the bug logging to, to see everything and turn all to, to a different log level such that the rest of the application stays silent, but one part speaks. You might have guessed would have required a little bit more space than a slide. Then we gotta do metrics, because we gotta wanna know how many requests we are doing per second, we gotta wanna know what the average degradation of the service, we wanna know gauges and, and, and any type of metric. And how do you really integrate metrics? Well, you gotta hook around with libraries linking to Prometheus and, or open telemetry that, that nowadays supports both tracing and metrics. But still, there's a lot of specialized code that you have to do to integrate those services. Tracing is the next one. Tracing in the sense of isolated parts of your program should define spans that are well named and within the spans you can attach attributes and 
some of those attributes might be this portion of the program failed for this reason with this stack trace. And all of that appears in a, on an online console where everything starts to make sense. And also tracing is very important if you're trying to optimize an app at scale. Because if you don't observe what's going on inside the app, you're not gonna have many ways of saying what's slow, what's fast, what's optimizable, what's not. Propagating span context is definitely not an easy thing. You could pass it explicitly by function arguments. More recently, you could use an approximation of thread local that ended up in stage two, which is the, which is the, the async context to keep the, the spans around. But still, one thing I've told you, in a span, if the process fails, if that span is failed, the error should be reported. What does it mean? It means literally you have to wrap pretty much all your code, every single piece of your code that you want to identify inside a span, inside a try catch. And in case you catch an exception, render the exception on the span and throw again. And maybe, maybe you need a little bit of the stability at some point. And really, the stability is about being able to inject dependencies, being, being able to inject mocked services, being able, being able to, uh, to inject test dummies and stuff like that. And you have various ways to do that. <laughs> you have inversion of control containers, again, explicit passing of function argument, and so on and so forth. Could follow cake pattern and, and all of that. But still, if you want to achieve the stability, and at some point in time you might, that's one thing you have to care about. And et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. There's so many things. And does any of you believe that the code I've shown before is actually maintainable? Would you be able to change that code confidently, being sure that nothing that nothing goes on, goes completely off, that you don't break it. No? No one confident enough to, to say, yeah, I can? Well, I am not the only one. I thought I was, I was the worst programmer in the world. So again, that's the, that's the short story of my life. Trying to build those systems, trying to scale those systems, trying to manage teams across code bases of hundreds of thousands of lines of code, and seeing those patterns over and over again. So two and a half years ago, actually a little bit more, I kind of set a personal goal. I wanted a composable set of solution. One of the main problems of, of all of the solutions that I've shown before is the fundamental lack of composability. If you remember, I was mentioning in the retry policy that we wrote, we had to couple together all, all of the options that defined the behavior of the policy. The try catch around every span and et cetera, et cetera, is specialized code. The, the, anything we've seen to this point was adding progressively to the code we had in a non-composable way. In a way where extracting a piece of logic to be shared between two different places of your program is a fundamentally hard thing. It's not impossible. You can, ca you, you can do composability on your own. You can build composable APIs on your code. Takes time and might be counterintuitive. So, Welcome to effect. We are going to redo the same thing with effect. And hopefully, if time allows, we are going to do a bit more than what we've, we've seen. I'm not going to go into too much details of what effect is. Nobody really cares about it, not even I do. 
to me, the, the simplest description that I could give, it's like a lazy promise. If I give you back, if I do fetch, I get back a promise, okay? The, the network operation already started. The promise represents only the result of that HTTP request. It doesn't represent the HTTP request itself. All of the information that that promise was generated from an HTTP request is lost. With effect, it's not like that. If I return an effect, no operations have, have started. That's a simple description of your code. It describes your intention. Only when you evaluate that effect into a fiber, then the actual effects run. What does that allow? higher order behavior and composability. Because given an effect, I don't have something that already happened. I can say, redo this effect, reevaluate 10 times. Reevaluate as long as it fails, and so on and so forth. So let's start to see how does it look. First, I am going to identify the failure scenarios. Not all of them, because still has to fit the slides, but at least some. Here, we are identifying a fetch error, and our request function, which is a simple wrapper around fetch, as you see, it says try catch promise, forces me to specify what the hell should I do in case this fails. And we're not gonna do that, that much here, but we're gonna flag that this error comes from a fetch error and then the JSON body deserialization can also fail. But it can fail for a JSON body error. And by the way, I don't know if you've noticed, first I have type check slides, but <laughs> look at this, it's here. When you call this, you know the reasons it could fail for. They're apparent. There's no need of further documentation in saying this might fail for reason A or B. When you have to deal with the result of this, you know it can fail for, for a fetch error. And the same thing goes on for, for the JSON body. Using effect is a fairly large system. I'm gonna list the modules after, but this is gonna be a very short introduction. One common pattern that I've seen in code is to kind of reorganize your imports, both from your internal modules and re-exporting stuff that may come from, from effect or from other libraries into kind of a common module or a set of common modules that you use across your code. I'm gonna do that here for the purpose of fitting stuff in slides because otherwise I spend too much on the import side. So using the fetch wrapper that, that we created before. Pipe might look unfamiliar to you, and it's fine. Uh, pipe is simply function application. This is exactly equivalent of taking this first argument and put it as a, as a further argument in here, as a not as a further argument, but this function, the flat map function, ends up returning another function. That function takes the first as an input. This is just a simulation of kind of a fluent API call. What, what we know with promises and what we would really like to have, but unfortunately is very ineffective and not reshakable, is to do HTTP dot request dot flat map dot, blah, dot, et cetera, et cetera. So ignore everything, read it, HTTP request, flat map, JSON body, which was the deserialization function. That's two lines of code. But this time I can check the type. And if you see, we have now three generic types here. The first one, ignore for now. I'm gonna clarify what it is shortly after. 
But in the second one, you see that now this, this get to do function, I have not annotated the return type. That's fully inferred. That function might fail for either a fetch error or a JSON body error. That's apparent, that's explicit. That's inferred from context. Then I had the get to do's. We started with a sequential implementation. I'm going to start with a sequential implementation. We are using collect all. Think of it like promise.all. And we're taking the, the IDs and we're applying get to do for every ID. So this is going to be an array of effects. And collect all collects the, the result. You see, in the result now, we, we end up having a chunk of unknown. Chunk is a more efficient version of an immutable array, which is fine for concatenating index lookup and stuff like that. It's an immutable data structure based on concat trees, if anyone is curious. Consider it a smart array. Nothing more complex than that. So I mentioned three type parameters. The first type parameter, which I said, I'm gonna mention it above, now it's never. That's gonna be the list of requirements your program needs to run. So an effect is a program, is a description of a program that when evaluated requires this context, which you think of it like the React context, might fail for this reason, and when successful, it gives you the result. Everything is explicit. Doesn't have to be explicit, but it can be explicit. That's optionality. How does handling failures look like as the equivalent of a try catch? First of all, we are importing from our to-dos that we just created before. Then our main function takes the program. This program is a program that's gonna give you the first to-do and the second to-do. And struct is a constructor to do that, that combines multiple, multiple effects. You have like about 100 constructors and about 300 combinators in total. So by no means I'm gonna show all here, but they all work in the same, the same logic, in the same way. Effects are composable. So our main, our main program takes the program, then it flat maps it, so it continues, and there's a log info. So we are doing multi-level logging here. And the next line again is catch tag. If you remember, here we have specified our errors are as tagged objects with a with a tag parameter. That's because in TypeScript tagged unions can be easily discriminated. Discriminatable. Catch tag. First of all, it will autocomplete you the potential errors that you may encounter, and this basically saying, okay, if I have a fetch error, do this. If I have a JSON body error, do that. And those are recovery functions. So this program now, which is the main program, doesn't really need anything, can never fail for a predictable reason. And in case of success, gives you back void. It's the main program, it just prints out stuff in the console. Here I've said something important. This program can never fail for an expected reason. It can still fail for whatever other reason that you might not know in advance. Effect doesn't lose that, that error if it happens. Effect, in, in, in fact, keeps track of all of the errors that might happen in your program and distinguish them between defects, which are 
non-easily recoverable errors or predictable errors that have a recovery behavior. Let's look at how resilience on failures look here. So another module available in effect is schedule. Schedule is a general representation of interval emissions. You can use it for retry, you can use it to emit multiple events, you can use it for any operation that needs to happen over a schedule of time. And the schedule is composable. Here I'm saying my retry schedule is an exponential big back off policy with a base of 20 milliseconds, of 10 milliseconds, and a growth factor of two up until the point, so it's either this policy or this policy, so either this or it's spaced of one second, that means this policy will progressively grow exponential up until till the point where this is faster, and so that's, that's like a, a limit, a cap. Then we say, okay, we further compose it, with the elapsed time since the beginning, and we want to continue while this elapsed time, elapsed time is lower or equal than 30 seconds. So that's a full description of a policy which is fully composable and isolated from your program. If you remember before, I told you it's going to be hard to have a, a policy in a place, a program in another, and a specialization of behavior from the program to the policy. The policy is predefined. In this case, we see our get to do function, so the function from before, starts the same way. But then I say retry. You retry using this schedule up until the point where the input is no longer well, while the input is, no, is not a JSON body, because if I'm getting back a response which is not in the format I was expecting, it doesn't really make sense to keep retrying. But best of all, this type is fully inferred. Escalation of failures. Told you before, we have multiple reasons for failures. Maybe after having retried with our policy, we continue with saying, if we are no longer gonna retry, then this error is final. It's not gonna be recoverable in the future. And that is done with this combinator, which says, transform any predictable failure in a defect. So if I now check the type of this, RIO, we are gonna kill this type aliases very quickly. This is an effect never, never unknown. Never is the error type. So the or, try, or, or die combinator is swallows all of the predictable errors to non-predictable one to defects. Then interruption. We spoke before about the abort controller, and that's the only way you have to kill uh, an ongoing fetch call. But effect has its own way, has its own context, its own propagation, can handle interruption, composable interruption. So if I want to turn my request to be interruptible, I can no longer use the, the try-catch combinator, but I got a hook in into this slow, uh, slightly lower level constructor, which is called a sync interrupt, which is, has a similar API to new promise. It's new promise, you get a resume and reject thing. In this case, you just get a resume and you resume with another effect instead of resuming with a result. But here, we are creating a controller, which is dedicated to this one passing the signal inside the fetch call, resuming in case of success with a successful effect, resuming in case of failure 
with a failed effect. And at the very end, we return, we return the way to cancel our operation. And one thing you can spot just straight up here. This is actually an asynchronous thing. Interruption is in itself an effect. With a board controller, you just get the signal of something that's to be cancelled. This allows you to wait up to the point where something is cancelled, and so on and so forth. I should mention that Interruption semantics is incredibly difficult, especially in cases where you have open, open-ended continuation like this, because you're progressive, you're returning back an effect. So you might imagine when I evaluate this, should the, should the second effect be interrupted? No, but it's interrupting. So anyway, that's, that's how you wrap it for inter interruption, that's about it. I don't have any to do anything else. And then we set control concurrency. And this is where things started to get messy. Now, get to those, initially we were using collect all. Now we can say collect all par. There is no equivalent for a promise cannot exist for a promise. But here we are saying, oh, okay, we want to we wanna get this list, and we're going to get it in parallel. And now you might say, oh, that's unbounded. That's the same type of critical behavior that you've shown before. Well, let's modify it. We modify it, we say, okay, this effect is going to run with parallelism of 15 requests. That makes it run at the maximum of 15, keeps it running up until the point where it's ended. And best of all, you could even delegate it to the caller. There is no point whatsoever in specifying with parallelism inside the get to do's. Because if get to do's does any parallel operation, your caller can independently say the whole program which might contain a hundred calls to get to do and, and a few hundred thousand of different things, the limit of parallelism is, is three this time. Higher order behavior. Metrics. This we didn't get the chance to do on the other side. Well, not even logging, but who cares about logging? Metrics, we're defining a counter it's a simple metric. I want to I wanna see how many get to do's calls have been done. I define the metric in this way. Then I say in the get to do function, get me the to do. And after that, I'm tapping the output. So I'm not going to change the, the output if you see this still returns an unknown. But I'm also going to increment the get to do metric. Or I could, the metrics themselves are composable. So you could specify that for any input, this metric will increment by one. And that allows us to, to use it this way. So get to do, this is the plain function. Up the metric is applied to it. When running, it's going to be exactly the same as this. And you can define any type of Prometheus compatible metrics. We have our own type of representation, so you don't need to bring in any external dependency that you don't, might not want to. You can still inspect the metrics even without having Prometheus locally or anything else, but they can be exported to open telemetry, to Prometheus, to whatever maps to that. Tracing. We currently have an open telemetry integration, full blown open telemetry integration. But given traces are so important, we're going to do the same that we did with metrics and bring them into, into our own representation, into the core of effect. So this is not real code yet. But 
it's going to be like that. And up until the point where we manage to bring it up in core, that's how it works in the auto extension package. So you see you have a, a get to do. And you say, OK, I want the span attribute to be the, the, this ID. And I want this span to be called get to do. Now, if there is a parent span, like in this case, that the get to do is called as a child of, of that, well, not, not in this one, because I wanted to cut off some, some lines. This should call this get to do n times. And I should not reuse the previous model. I should simply re-implement it. But if there is a parent span, this is automatically created as a child span of the parent. If this effect fails for any reason, the failure will be reported in the span. There's no try catch here. Dependency injection. We describe services using plain interfaces, code to interface, as they as they like to say. Then we gotta specify how to identify this service within the context. That's done via via tag. Just ignore what the tag is. Know that you have to use it anytime you want to access the service or provide the service, which is why I call it exactly the same as the interface itself. When I import one, I automatically ended up ending up importing the other. And I can use it very seamlessly. That's just representing this type at a value level, fundamentally. And our program, I'm now bringing in another, another type of syntax, which is the generator syntax. The generator syntax looks like uh, an async await, precisely like an async await, with the difference that this time it's clear apparent from here that this program to run needs a to-do repo. And in here, we are accessing the to-dos from within the context. So in this, we had never said what actually getting a to-do in. To say what does it mean for, for the program to get a to-do, you have to provide this in the main. If you fail to provide it, unsafe run will complain that you're not providing anything, everything. And layers are very good as as constructors, you might guess that your implementation of the to-do repository ends up needing the live, the, the HTTP service. And so this is a simulation of a program that needs both. And here I'm creating a context, a layer, that has both. So recapping quickly, because I'm running out of time. We've done errors. We've done retries. We've done concurrency. We've done interruption. We've done logging. We've done tracing. We've done metrics. We've done dependencies. And that's it. What's in the box? A thousand of other modules. You can do scopes, which are like database connections. If you have a database connection, you have something to open. Your program needs to run. And database connection needs to be closed. That's a scope. So scoped resources, fiber, queue, work stealing queues, workers, and stuff like that. Hubs, pops up inside your program. Layers, we've seen those. Metrics, we've seen those. Uh, logger, we've seen that. References are a way of keeping state uh, synchronized, potentially mutable state around your program. Schedule, we've seen. Stream, full-blown implementation of full-based streams. That's like an, an effect that yields many values. And deferred, like a promise, STM, uh, like transactional data structures, and so on and so forth. What are the early adopters saying? That's our lovely Johannes from this morning answering to probably a friend of himself. 
and saying, I would not describe effect in this way myself, but given I have a tweet, I wanted to place it here. There already is. It's called effect and it's glorious. For me, it's the best thing that happened to web dev since TypeScript. Still early, but you'll hear more about it soon. I don't know <laughs> if it's that big, but I can definitely tell you it felt like building something that big. Thank you very much. Reach out to me after and follow us. Thank you so much, Michael. Thanks a lot. The, the information was, was incredible. And I, I agree. It's, uh, it's definitely something to check out. I want to build stuff with effect as well. I've wanted to since I spoke with Michael last night about it. It's a, very, it's a very compelling thing. Unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. We need to move a little bit quickly if we want to stay on schedule. Um, so I will introduce the next speaker already. Uh, let's hear it once again for Michael, everybody.